Um, so I'm Jan Wills and I'm speaking as the manager of the 21st Century uh, Challenges Project. My uh, mission this afternoon is to tell you what we talked about in the six online discussions and workshops. And uh, I've got quite a lot of information to get over, so I'm going to go at a bit of a gallop. And uh, unfortunately, I'm a bit hoarse, um, so I hope my voice holds up. You can see I'm channeling Tim, and that is I, the end, I promise you, of the racing related jokes. Um, we, uh, as I said, there's a lot of information, but we've got a whole hour for discussion. So um, if I race through things, there will be time to come back and elaborate and discuss um, later on. So in the project, these are the six topics that we discussed. We talked about archives, professional standards and guidance, designation and management of archaeology, particularly against the background of changes in the planning system, new models for local archaeological services, concentrating particularly on local government, but also touching on historic England services. Um, Synthesis of information from developer-funded investigation and archaeological um, publication. The order that we discuss these things in may seem a little bizarre because we started with archives and you might think that that really logically comes towards the end of the archaeological process. Um, and we could regroup the topics rather more logically, um, as you can see on the slide. So I think of, and I'm going to discuss the workshops in this order, so I'm going to look at legislation and policy, standards and guidance, both of which, or all of which, forms our key framework for archaeological practice. I'm going to look at um, delivery mechanisms in the public sector, so local government and historic England. And then the second half, the three parts of the archaeological process that form the other three workshops, synthesis, publication, and archive. Um, for each topic that we discussed, and I hope that many of you have discovered this already on the website, and also there are some reports. There aren't any reports. There were going to be some reports yeah, Somewhere in this building there are some reports. I will let you know, research that for you, Jan. Okay, there were going to be some which were available to have in hard copy in your hand and there might be later. But what there is on the website are notes of all the discussions, summaries of the issues, and the proposed actions around each topic. Um, the uh, actions arose from principally the last plenary session of every workshop where we said to the assembled participants what can we actually do about the issues we talked about and who might be identified as the um, doers of those things so you can see all that on the CIFA website just a quick recap on where we are with the project um, project ran during 2017. The outputs became progressively available on the CIFA website. We're now at the conference discussion, and um, we want to hear, as Steve said, your thoughts on the discussions and the outputs from those workshops. We will then take the summary of today's discussion and feed it into our project report, which should be available um, in June this year. And then um, following that, CIFA and Historic England will be talking to sector partners and we hope to get to put together an, implement, an implementation plan um, to deliver some of our key priorities that we um, all agree need to be taken forward. So um, I'm now going to look at each of the six topics and try to give you a flavour of the key things we discussed. We're going to look at the recommendations later on in the second half this afternoon. Um, but here's a um, very quick speed through each of the topics. So first of all, we talked about legislation and policy. And the question we really asked in this workshop was have we got the right framework of legislation and policy for the 21st century? And um, the response of our participants was about 50-50, yes and no. 
as to who thought the system we work with at the moment works well and is fit for purpose. Strongly caveated by people who said, well, the system we've got actually is quite a good one, but we need the resources to make it work properly. So on legislation, we explored legislative opportunities via Brexit bills, something that Tim touched on this morning. What could we push forward in terms of all the bills, like an agriculture bill, digital bill, which might come forward in the context of Brexit? We looked at using what we have in legislation better, and this focused very much around scheduling and whether we actually use the potential of scheduling properly at the moment, particularly given the fact that we are very worried about how things work through the planning system. And we um, touched on longer term aspirations for changes in heritage legislation, which may seem like a distant dream, but we felt that we ought to be having the conversations now about those things that we might aspire to in the medium to longer term. On the planning system, we looked with um, some degree of horror on the direction of travel, of planning reform, and we're very worried about how this might weaken our post-PPG 16 system for the protection and management of archaeology. But we also were more positive in the sense that we looked at how we might change professional practice in the light of that, and in particular, how we might do better with what we've got. And a very, very strong feature of that was the need to move forward on the National Importance Project, which already has a policy basis in the MPPF. At the bottom of each slide, as I go through the six, of which this is the first, there's a, a, a run of general themes. And I think these were the general themes that come out of the workshops and link them all together. And my final slide will pick up on these general themes. Standards and guidance um, is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, we started off, as, as we often do, worrying about definitions. What does it mean? What are standards? What is advice? What is guidance? And why are there so many organisations that produce what appear to be overlapping and conflicting standards, guidance and advice? So um, we discussed quite a bit the huge weight of documentation and the lack of clarity in terms of how it all fits together and what the hierarchy is. Who should produce what? We thought we could do better on this. Um, we also focused, as you might expect, on CIFA standards and guidance and the need to expand, enhance and develop our existing suite of professional standards. But as well as discussing standards, we also touched on innovation and asked whether actually we're stuck in a bit of a process rut. Have we moved on? Are we able to innovate in professional practice? Is there a tension between standards and developing um, new ways of doing things. And then lastly, there's a big area of discussion around um, self-regulation, enforcement, <coughs> compliance, and the whole issue of bad practice. We felt there's a lot of anecdotal material around about bad professional practice, but actually very little of that translates into specific um, complaints and professional conduct cases. We thought that writing standards and guidance is only the first step and actually getting people to comply with what we have is a much bigger issue. Realistically enforcement can only happen in a very small minority of cases and we felt that a really big issue for all of us is the professional responsibility to self-regulate Number three, we're coming up to halfway. Uh, this is the issue, number three is the issue of the state of the public sector, especially local government capacity, but also how local government services relate to historic England. So together they provide advice, information, regulation that makes our system work. We know, I think, what the problems are. Um, I think it's actually a 33% loss of staff in local government since 2006, 
but we've probably lost a couple of people since I wrote this slide, so it may be quite accurate mm -hmm. now. Historic England halved, uh, funding halved in the last um, 10 years. Um, it's not just about numbers. In local government, we're losing staff, but we're also losing senior staff, which inevitably leads to loss of influence on corporate policy and practice. The current situation in local government is that there's huge diversity in structures, how people work, size of services, from no service at all in some areas to services which, despite all the difficulties, are innovative and are actually making good services work. We didn't talk so much about Historic England, but I will just touch on it and say that, of course, at the same time as we're having these conversations, Historic England is looking at its own structure and how it relates to um, local government services, particularly in planning. In this workshop, there was no particular enthusiasm for radical structural change in the way local government is organised. And I think maybe this is um, partly a continuing desire to protect what we have, but also I think a more realistic uh, acknowledgement of the fact that what services we have are so much uh, determined by political choices and that it's so much of what we might want to change is actually out with our power to, to, to make those changes. But we nevertheless um, touched on new potential models. We talked about the um, idea of fighting for statutory uh, status for local government services. Um, we talked about leadership and advocacy for those services. And I think there was a very, very strong feeling in the workshop that actually we don't have a consistent national advocacy or leadership line on local government. And lastly, we talked about the whole training, mentoring, dissemination of good practice issue. There are some really good services out there that are surviving, but we felt we could do a lot more to bring that um, good practice and that knowledge um, to services that really need support and help and might be able to um, secure their activities better um, with some input from some mentoring and some training for people who um, had um, been able to innovate. So, um, I'm sort of changing tack slightly now to talk about the three workshops, the three topics which relate much more to archaeological um, process and practice. And the first one of these was synthesis. The starting point here really is how do we grapple with, how do we facilitate and fund the synthesis of the vast amount of data that archaeological investigation funded as a consequence of development is now generating? And how do we manage from this mass of data to fund the creation of new historical narratives. We talked about a lot of the issues that frustrate that process. Um, data standards, huge variability in standards, in HERs, in um, uh, reports, and outputs from investigative work, which makes it difficult to achieve synthesis. It makes it very expensive to bring together data, to make comparisons and to distill that knowledge into narrative. Um, we talked about the problems of accessing data from investigations, um, because a lot of it isn't available online at all, or isn't available in a form in which it can be easily used without reworking and investing a lot of new money. Um, we considered the, whether there was an appropriate level of research focus in our investigation projects and concluded that there probably wasn't. And we touched on developer attitudes and one of our participants um, set out what I think might be the ideal as the informed, research-driven, developer-funded investigation that delivers new knowledge. I think that's what we thought we wanted to do but probably weren't very confident that we're actually um, currently achieving it. All of this, well not all of a lot of this new knowledge comes from investigations that are generated by the development and the planning system. 
But it is a, a, a fact in the structure of the planning system that everything happens piecemeal. So we looked at the planning system and thought about how can we try to deliver synthesis when everything is, information is coming out of individual developments and it's very difficult to actually bring that together and fund the synthesis needed um, from something which is driven by the planning process. We concluded on funding that collaboration is needed, but our structures and commercial competition can militate against this. Uh, and concluded also that Historic England funding in this area is still vitally important in scoping and pump priming projects that might possibly then achieve funding through other mechanisms. Moving on to publication. Um, on publication, we started in looking backwards at what had been um, done before in 2003 when CBA looked at what we actually need in terms of publication, um, audience uh, and user needs. We concluded that we hadn't actually got very far on the recommendations of the 2003 report. And we decided that what we really needed was a new survey of what our audiences want and need. In the um, course of the workshop, we designed um, what I've called on this slide a new framework for archaeological um, publishing. And um, I'm not sure it's really uh, entirely new, but our pri in this framework, the primary publication is conceived as full publication online as a professional obligation of the site archive, the data sets derived from it, um, the analysis and a narrative. And then what we call the secondary publication, which would be more or less, depending on the significance of the site in question. This would allow, stand or should allow, standardization in the former, but innovation in the latter. And we concluded that the terms were awful and we shouldn't use them, but actually we can come up with better ones in the course of the um, workshop. So you may have strong views on that, or at least you may have some better terms. Um, training and sharing good practice and use of an oasis from project inception were other things we talked about. And lastly, before you get information overload, we talked about archaeological archives. We started talking about the archaeological archives crisis and we had an immediate sense of deja vu. Haven't we been talking about the so-called crisis for a very long time without doing or achieving very much about it? Actually, we then acknowledged that there has been a lot of progress through the Archaeological Archives Forum and through the CFER Special Interest Group, just as two examples. Once we'd moved past the crisis, we were actually in quite a positive mood and talked a lot about how we need to value the archive and stop talking about it as a problem, a burden, and something that you kind of do at the last minute when you've finished everything else and you can get rid of all those boxes. Actually, the archive is an asset and we should think about it right from project inception, not at the last minute. There have been a lot of surveys of our, about archives, particularly focused on storage and curation. But perhaps what we don't really know too much about, enough about, is who uses them. So we identified that as something that we felt needed to be taken forward. And of course, we talked about boxes and storage. We've done now nationally and also more locally in the southwest a lot of survey work on undepositable archives, those things which can't be deposited because there isn't the space or the museum curatorial expertise to care for them. And we identified that as something that needs urgent action. We talked about transfer of title the legal position is commonly understood. And also, we heard about some um, quite different interpretations of um, ownership of archaeological archives. Uh, we talked about funding and um, the need to understand the real cost of um, creating, storing, curating archives, the whole life cost, and how we might apportion that between public and private uh, sectors. <coughs> 
We asked the question, can we really keep everything? And we concluded that we can't, and therefore we need better selection and retention policies. And we thought about digital, and we thought um, that we didn't uh, exploit emerging digital technologies enough. Now, um, you've all got indigestion after that. Um, how are we doing for time? <laughs> okay. So um, all of those workshops have a lot of individual uh, themes um, that we discussed. Many of them um, had things which kept cropping up, and those are the things which I've grouped together on the last slide. And I'll just talk about these a little bit, but I think I hope that a lot of them will come up in discussion. Inevitably, politics um, provided a fairly um, chunky and interesting uh, backdrop to many of our discussions, particularly about policy and legislation, uh, local government, uh, the public sector generally. I think we are acutely aware of um, the deregulation and austerity agendas and that much of what we might want to achieve uh, was swimming against the political tide at this particular moment. Although there's huge public interest and participation in archaeology, we never seem to quite make it through. Um, and heritage, I think, is not an issue that has commands much political <coughs> interest, certainly um, in the Westminster government. Much of the direction of travel of the current government is inimical to some of the core features, I would argue, of our current system. So the importance of advocacy is clear. Um, sexual leadership was something that kept popping up. Um, do we have any coherence as a sector? The British Academy thought we needed a single strong voice. I think many of us didn't necessarily agree with that, but I think we have to ask ourselves whether we do work together collaboratively, strongly enough, and whether we are able to um, do that advocacy work, which is so uh, much needed. The linked issue, um, structure, communication across the profession. Um, People can collaborate and communicate well, despite structures, um, but are we actually really doing it? We talk about the, um, our silos that we all work in, curator, consultant, um, contractor, the public sector, local government. Um, on many issues, we felt in discussion that progress was hampered um, by the fact that there's just too little discussion across those silos. Um, standards and guidance was, was a core part of our discussions. I think every topic we talked about, we thought, yes, we must have better standards and guidance. And that links to the more general theme of professionalism. And I mentioned professional self-regulation before, um, but I think it's a really important issue, and I'm not sure it's something we, as a profession, have really got embedded in our thinking. Um, protection and management and the changing planning system, again this kept coming up in our discussions, even if we weren't really talking about planning and legislation. Um, the system we've got now is a, a consequence of a development of the changes that took place in 1990 and PPG 16. But um, most of the way we um, manage to facilitate archaeological investigation and protection depends on a few lines in the national planning policy framework. It's actually very vulnerable. Um, I think in almost every workshop, the importance of local authority <coughs> services came up. And that's because of um, the fact that the vast majority of the archaeological resource is managed by <coughs> local services. It depends on the advice and information they're able to provide. Um, and also, um, the curatorial expertise in terms of curating the products of investigation um, in local museums. So although we have a, um, 
I think what we could describe as a, as a buoyant at the moment, a, a successful commercial sector, it does depend on the public sector in one or two really key elements. And some of those elements are very, very shaky at the moment. Um, digital world, I think I've said already, and it, it was a recurrent theme, um, we felt that we weren't very much um, in the lead on this and that we've not made enough use of uh, developing digital technologies. Um, public value, um, do we really uh, articulate very well what we consider to be um, the value of archaeology and the public benefit it delivers? And do we ask our communities and our public how they value archaeology, whether they value it or in what ways enough? I think we felt, again, a recurrent theme that this is a, an important and linking um, topic. And lastly, um, although, as Steve said, these, uh, this project focused on England, then we invited colleagues from Wales and Scotland to um, all of our workshops. And uh, we had some really useful input. And it's clear that um, as devolution um, gets more and more um, embedded, or whatever the correct word is, uh, our systems are uh, diverging. Things are very different in public policy in Scotland and in Wales. And um, there's been a lot of legislative change and progress in, in um, other countries, in Wales in particular. So I think on um, that, we felt that perhaps we need to uh, work together a bit more across the UK and learn um, from each other uh, about how these systems are developing and what we in England can perhaps take from um, our colleagues across the borders. Okay, that's um, me done, and um, I hope you're not too indigested. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chad. Well, now.